my first writing job was on a TV show called Get a Life, starring Chris Elliott. Um, the show was really mostly in the voice of its creators, Chris Elliott and Adam Resnick. They had, a, they had worked together on David Letterman's show, and, and Chris's character came from that show. Um, so consequently, Adam Resnick's scripts were the best in the, of the show. And we all tried to write in Adam's voice. That was the job. And I was frustrated with my results. But it occurred to me that there was no solution to this problem as long as my job was trying to imitate someone else's voice. I could maybe get close, but I was never going to get better at it than Adam. The obvious solution was not to throw my hands up, but try to find myself in a situation where I was doing me, not someone else. Do you. It isn't easy, but it's essential. It's not easy because there's a lot in the way. In many cases, a major obstacle is your deeply seated belief that you is not interesting. And since convincing yourself that you are interesting is probably not going to happen, take it off the table. <laughs> Agree. Perhaps I'm not interesting. But I am the only thing I have to offer. And I want to offer something. And by offering myself in a true way, I am doing a great service to the world. Because it is rare and it will help. As I move through time, things change. I change, the world changes. The way the world sees me changes. I age, I fail, I succeed, I am lost. I have a moment of calm. The remnants of who I have been, however, hover, depress me, embarrass me, make me wistful. The inkling of who I will be depresses me, makes me hopeful, scares me, embarrasses me. And here I stand at this crossroads, always embarrassed, wistful, depressed, angry, longing, looking back, looking forward. I may make a decision and move from that crossroads, at which point I find myself instantly at another crossroads. Therefore, there is only movement. A screenplay is movement. It is written in time and expresses a passage of time. It is made in time, and it is viewed in time. It's a movie. It moves. That's two hours I'll never get back. It's a favorite thing for an angry person to say about a movie he hates. But the thing is, Every two hours, or two hours, he'll never get back. <laughs> you cannot hoard your two houses. <laughs> so you are here, and I am here, spending our time as we must. It must be spent. I am trying not to spend this time as I spend most of my time trying to get you to like me trying to control your thoughts, to use my voodoo at the speed of light, the speed of sound, at the speed of thought, trying to convince you that your two hours with me are not going to be resented afterwards. It is an ancient pattern of time usage for me. And I'm trying to move deeper, hoping to be helpful. This pattern of time usage paints over an ancient wound and paints it with bright colors. It's a sleight of hand, a distraction. So to attempt to change the pattern, let me expo expose the wound. I now step into this area blindly. I do not know what the wound is. I do know that it is old. I do know that it is a hole in my being. I do know it is tender. I do believe that it is unknowable, or at least inarticulable. I do believe you have a wound, too. I do believe it is both specific to you and common to everyone. I do believe it is the thing about you that must be hidden and protected. It is the thing that is tap danced over five shows a day. It is the thing that won't be interesting to other people if revealed. It is the thing that makes you weak and pathetic. It is the thing that truly, truly, truly makes loving you impossible. It is your secret, even from yourself. But it is the thing that wants to live. It is the thing from which your art, your painting, your dance, your composition, your philosophical treatise, your screenplay is born. If you don't acknowledge this, you will come up here when it is your time and you will give your speech, and you will talk about the business of screenwriting. You will say that as a screenwriter, you are a cog in a business machine. You will say it is not an art form. You will say, here, this is what a screenplay looks like. You will discuss character arcs, how to make likable characters. You will talk about box office. This is what you will do. This is who you will be. And after you're done, I will feel lonely and empty and hopeless. 
I like when people like my things. I mean, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm not crazy. Well, I am crazy, but I'm not that crazy. But, but you know, but, I, but, I, but it has to be on the terms that make sense to me. I want to, I want to like it. If other people like it, that's really good and, and great because it means that something that I've said has somehow, you know, resonated with somebody. And that's, that's amazing. I want that. But, I, but it has to be the thing that I've said. When I first started to work in series television, I didn't need to take a course in how to write a half-hour comedy. I knew because I had been raised as a consumer of TV series. I understood the rhythms. I understood the types of jokes that were acceptable. I understood the stock characters. And of course, all of this was in service of the perpetuation of the same consumer culture that trained me and made me desire to be part of it. I was a zombie. It's a massive issue because the business I'm in is the same business that politicians and corporations are in. It's a business of selling something that's important to them by disguising it as something that's important to you. And it's ubiquitous. And I don't think it's symbiotic. What I'm trying to express, what I'd like to express, is the notion that by being honest, thoughtful, and aware of the existence of other living beings, a change can begin to happen in how we think of ourselves and the world and ourselves in the world. We are not the passive audience for this big, messed up power play. We don't have to be. We can say who we are. We can assert our right to existence. We can say to the bullies and con men, the people who try to shame us, embarrass us, flatter us, to the people who have no compunction about lying to us to get our money and our allegiance, that we are thinking, really thinking about who we are, and we will express ourselves, and with this, other people won't feel so alone. This is Harold Pinter. A writer's life is a highly vulnerable, almost naked activity. We don't have to weep about that. The writer makes his choice and is stuck with it. But it is true to say that you are open to all the winds, some of them icy indeed. You are out on your own, out on a limb. You find no shelter, no protection, unless you lie. In which case, of course, you have constructed your own protection and, it could be argued, become a politician. It's weird to be a human. We get to think about things. We get to wonder. This seems like quite a privileged position in the universe, and I wouldn't give it up for certainty. Because when you're certain, you stop being curious. And here's the one thing I know about the thing you're certain about. You're wrong. Of course, this is a paradox. How is it possible to know that you can't know anything? It isn't. It's just a theory. And I remain open to being proven wrong. <laughs> Think about your reaction to me. Think past it. Why do you have that reaction? Why do you react this certain way to certain things? What does your reaction have to do with your wants? How does it correlate? How would, you, how would your reaction to what I'm saying change if I were older, younger, female, a different race, British? What does it mean about you that it would change? What does it mean about the subjectivity, subjectivity of your opinions? What if I was me but had a different demeanor? What if I was more confident, less confident? What if I was more effeminate? What if I was less effeminate? What if I was drunk? What if I was on the verge of tears? Think about all the assessments, all the in interpretations that occur with each react interaction. Think about all that you bring to each encounter. Multiply that by all the people here. How much is going on in this room? And how do we weave that into a movie? The challenge of multiple points of view forces us to come up with new solutions, to throw away conventional approaches. Movies tend to be very concrete in their construction of events and characters. It's a tricky medium in which to deal with interior lives. But I think it's really a great medium for it. Movies share so much with dreams, which of course only deal with interior lives. Your brain is wired to turn emotional states into movies. Your dreams are very well written. I know this without knowing any of you. People turn anxieties, crises, and longing, love, regret, and guilt into beautiful, rich stories in their dreams. What is it that allows us the creative freedom in our dreams that we don't have in our waking lives? I don't know, but I suspect part of it is that in our dreams we are not constricted by worry about how we will appear to others. It's a private conversation with ourselves. And if we're worried about it, this becomes part of the dream. 
I think if we were better able to approach our, our work this way, the results would be different.